Uh, welcome to the afternoon session of our conference. This afternoon we are broadcasting to the world via the internet with a live stream. So uh, let me suggest to you that it will be good to, if you have questions, to speak with a microphone. And so if you'll raise your hand, we'll get make sure to get a microphone to you so that every uh, the audio is very good in uh, heading out of this building. This morning we heard from uh, people from the private sector. Uh, we heard from people uh, at the uh, executive from the executive branch, and now I am delighted to introduce Ruth Milton, who is the chief of the Wireless uh, Bureau at the Federal Communications Commission which is really right at the center of this issue that we have teed up for this conference, which is the intersection of technology and policy and the evolution of those together. Ruth has been a leading voice in this space. Uh, it is, uh, she is entrusted with leading the FCC's efforts in this regard. We are delighted to have her here, so please help me welcome Ruth Mel. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, John. Thank you to the Georgetown Center for Business and Public Policy and to PCCA for inviting me to speak today. It's okay that I've got the post-lunch speaking slot on a gorgeous Friday afternoon. I'm happy to be here. I just had a five-hour energy drink and I am ready to go. <laughs> I'm particularly excited to be part of a workshop on optimal co-evolution even if it does sound kind of like a euphemism for couples counseling. <laughs> but, but setting aside one's opinions of the word co-evolution, that concept and the premise of the workshop today is a really important one. The simple truth is that realizing the enormous economic and societal benefits of mobile broadband is directly intertwined with wireless policy. So today I'd like to talk about the policy actions that the FCC has taken and plans to take to seize the opportunities of mobile, and especially our efforts to unleash spectrum for broadband, remove barriers to wireless infrastructure, and promote competition. We really need to get wireless policy right because the potential benefits for mobile broadband, of mobile broadband are so great. By now, everybody in this room knows that mobile innovation presents a huge opportunity to drive our economy forward. And according to a new study from the McKinsey Global Institute, mobile offers the huge opportunity for economic growth. So the McKinsey study looked at more than 100 disruptive technologies and tried to determine which would have the greatest, is likely to have the greatest economic impact over the next decade. They named the top 12, and it included things like advanced robotics, next generation genomics, energy storage, 3D printing, and renewable energy. But number one on their list was mobile internet. McKinsey predicts that mobile internet could generate a global annual economic effect of 3.7 to 10.8 trillion dollars by 2025. That is trillion with a truck. They estimate that by that, that date, approximately 80% of all internet connections would be through a mobile device. But mobile broadband's economic potential isn't just the subject of future speculation, it's already one of the fastest growing sectors of our economy. The apps economy, which was still in its infancy when I returned to the commission in 2009, has already created an estimated 500,000 US jobs. From 2009 to 2012, annual investment in wireless networks increased approximately 40% to $30 billion. And in 2013, for the first time, consumer spending on mobile broadband is expected to surpass consumer spending on fixed broadband, reaching over $50 billion. The mobile revolution represents a unique opportunity for the United States in a competitive global economy. The US leads the world in moving to LTE, GSMA estimates that only 2% of wireless connections in the European Union will be LTE by the end of 2013. Compare that to the United States, 
where almost 19% of wireless connections are expected to be LTE in that time frame. And Deloitte has estimated that 4G investment and innovation could help create up to 771,000 US jobs, new US jobs, by 2016. At the Commission, we've worked to create an environment for mobile innovation and investment over the past four years, focusing on spectrum, infrastructure, and competition policies. The federal government, for better or worse, controls access to spectrum, the oxygen that sustains wireless communications. The FCC has moved over the decades from a command and control approach to market-oriented policies, including flexible use and licensing by auction. But FCC policies still significantly affect the use of spectrum. We have technical rules pursuant to Section 303 designed to prevent harmful interference. We have service and auction rules that support competition as required by Section 309J. And government has a key role with respect to wireless infrastructure as well. State and local governments have zoning laws that affect the ability of wireless providers and tower companies to site antennas. And there are federal environmental and historic preservation laws that also have a substantial effect on antenna siting. In 2009, the Commission went to work on America's first national broadband plan, which was released in 2010. And one of the most notable aspects of the plan was that it was the first to give equal weight to mobile broadband. The plan sounded the alarm on the spectrum crunch, and those warnings have proved prescient. U.S. mobile data traffic grew by over 1,200% from 2009 to 2013, and the growth is expected to continue. Cisco predicts that U.S. mobile data traffic will grow ninefold by 2017. And this growth is driven in part by consumer adoption of smartphones and tablets. But it's also driven by ever faster technology. In 2012, 4G connections generated almost four and a half times the amount of mobile, da mobile data traffic as non-4G non connections. If they build it, people will use it. To meet the increasing demand for spectrum, the National Broadband Plan recommended that the Commission make available 300 megahertz of spectrum for mobile broadband by 2015, and that the Commission free additional spectrum for, for unlicensed use. So we've already done a great deal towards these goals. In 2010, the Commission created a new spectrum sharing paradigm by enabling unlicensed devices to access the unused spectrum between television channels. That's the TV white spaces. And unlicensed spectrum has become an integral part of the wireless ecosystem. The aggregate capacity of the world's Wi-Fi networks, which use unlicensed spectrum, is 28 times greater than the capacity of the world's 3G and 4G networks, which use licensed airwaves. In the fall of 2012, the Commission adopted rule changes to the Wireless Communications Service 30 megahertz by removing long-standing technical barriers to the use of that band for broadband. And in 2012, the Commission also created new rules to enable 40 megahertz of spectrum in the mobile satellite service to be used for terrestrial broadband, the newly created AWS 4 band. And we've taken steps to remove some seemingly small, but in reality significant impediments to the use of spectrum for broadband, such as a rule change in the uh, 800 megahertz ESMR band to open 14 megahertz for broadband. The Commission has also taken significant actions to reduce barriers to infrastructure deployment. In 2009, the Commission adopted a wireless facility siting shot clock to help ensure both the industry's needs for timely wireless deployment and state and local government's right to review siting applications. More recently, the Bureau heard from both the industry and from localities that the language of the law passed by Congress in 2012 to streamline certain types of wireless infrastructure deployments, that that law was creating significant confusion. So the Bureau took action, releasing a public notice, providing guide, guidance on our understanding of the meaning of various terms in the law. In May of this year, the Commission approved an interim waiver streamlining the regulatory process for the placement of temporary wireless <coughs> structures like cells on wheels or cows, cells on light trucks, colts, and that those allow wireless providers to meet surges in traffic, for example, at special events. 
and all the while in our actions to increase the availability of spectrum and reduce barriers to infrastructure deployment, we've kept an eye on competition and pursued policies that promote a competitive market structure. We refined and expanded how we, how we examine competition in the broader mobile ecosystem by revamping the annual wireless competition report. We added data and analysis that capture more aspects of the mobile marketplace, including the remarkable growth of the apps economy and technological advancements in devices. And this allows us to identify key trends, but it also creates a solid foundation for wireless policy, including, for example, our policies on infrastructure, data roaming, and other competition policies. In 2011, the Commission adopted data roaming requirements, and before that time, wireless providers were offering roaming arrangements, but only for voice services. There was no requirement to offer data roaming or roaming for data services like internet access. But as we know from the mobile competition reports, voice traffic is down and data traffic is way up. Today, an estimated 30% of web browsing and 40% of social media use is on mobile devices. So based on a record that demonstrated the significant public interest benefits, the commission required providers to offer data roaming. Consumers benefit by having continuous access to data services while traveling outside their provider service areas. For all our progress to date, we have a lot more to do if we want America to retain its global leadership position and realize mobile broadband's potential to drive our economy and improve the lives of all Americans. But before I talk about the specific policy approaches that are underway, I want to spend a moment talking about the FCC's governing approach. Fundamentally, the Communications Act requires the FCC to establish policies and rules that serve the public interest, convenience, and necessity. And there are occasions on which serving a collection of private interests is not the same thing as serving the public interest. And part of our job is to know the difference. For example, serving the public interest requires us to balance the goals and objectives of existing businesses with those of emerging challengers who will develop new technologies and business models to drive innovation and competition. That's challenging in several respects. The McKinsey report focused on disruptive technologies. And if we want to promote innovation in mobile broadband, we need to enable upstart entrepreneurs as well as established companies to compete in the mobile broadband marketplace, whether it's by providing services or making devices or developing apps or something else. That's one of the reasons it's so important to have some spectrum available for unlicensed use. That's a place where companies and individuals can innovate without permission. It can be difficult for entrepreneurs and startups to dedicate time and resources to commission proceedings. Entrepreneurs and others in startup companies are understandably focused on their businesses. They're in the proverbial garage. They're not at the FCC. And of course, there are other stakeholders, including consumers, that may not be able to commit the time or the resources to advocate before the commission. When I first started working at the FCC in the mid-1980s, I was fresh off a judicial clerkship and a year out of law school. And I did my first comment summary in a rulemaking proceeding and said to my supervisor that I was so surprised that all the comments were self-serving. <laughs> I shouldn't have been surprised. That's the job of the lawyers for those companies. They are supposed to advocate for the private interests of the company. But the, lawyer, the job of the lawyers and other policymakers at the FCC is to make recommendations to the commission about the public interest. And that's what all of us try to do every day. A few times lately, I have heard that folks from entities that shall remain nameless are saying that FCC engineers are not doing their jobs, or they're not doing them correctly, because these public servants are not doing what those particular entities are advocating. It's as if my experience as a young FCC attorney were reversed. These people are surprised that the FCC employees are actually trying to figure out what's in the public interest. We've got a lot of big policy decisions ahead, and I think we'd all do well to remember that our jobs are different. And of course, commission decisions can be, and often are, reviewed by the US Courts of Appeals, and sometimes even the Supreme Court. Two recent court decisions are worth mentioning. 
because they affirmed a couple of key FCC decisions with respect to infrastructure and spectrum licensing. The Supreme Court recently upheld the decision by the Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit, finding that the Commission's interpretation of its statutory authority when it created the tower setting shot clock was a permissible construction. And the, DC, the Court of Appeals for the DC Circuit found that the Commission's data roaming rules were within the Commission's authority to regulate electromagnetic spectrum. And those decisions are significant because they affirm the Commission's authority to implement policies that promote mobile broadband. Going forward, of course we continue to, to strive to foster an environment of innovation and investment. Our actions are designed to further three public policy priorities, freeing additional spectrum, removing barriers to infrastructure deployment, and promoting robust competition. And across each of these priorities, we're pursuing innovative policy approaches, necessitated in part by the growing complexity of the wireless broadband marketplace. Let's first talk about freeing additional spectrum for flexible use. The Commission is working towards licensing 65 megahertz of spectrum for flexible use services, including mobile broadband, by February 2015, consistent with our congressional directive. That includes the H block adjacent to the PCS bands and the AWS 3 bands. These and other bands may present unique or challenging technical and policy issues. Some of the bands are used by the federal government today. Others present technical issues that have to be solved to ensure that the new spectrum can be put to use without causing harmful interference to existing licensees. A report in order that would adopt licensing service and technical rules for the H block is tentatively slated to be on the Commission's June meeting, and that's an opportunity to free up to 10 megahertz of spectrum for <coughs> mobile broadband. The Spectrum Act also requires us to license 25 megahertz in the 2155 to 2180 megahertz band, another 15 megahertz between 1675 and 1710, and an additional 15 megahertz to be identified by the Commission. We're working on proposals to meet all of these statutory objectives. As then Chairman Janikowski pointed out in a letter to Assistant, to it, sorry, Administrator, NTIA Administrator Strickling earlier this year, the exact configuration of the bands will depend on how discussions about federal and commercial spectrum sharing proceed. The broadcast incentive auction will also help us meet the, de the need for, for new spectrum for mobile broadband. First proposed in the National Broadband Plan, the incentive auction is a major policy innovation. Nobody in the world has ever tried to do this kind of auction before. And it will be a success if we achieve three public interest goals. First, if the incentive auction allows the United States to lead the world in a new generation of wireless technologies and services. Second, if it alleviates spectrum constraints to economic growth and development. And third, if it funds the objectives laid out in the statute, including FirstNet. The path to success in the incentive auction is a balanced approach that frees up spectrum for licensed and unlicensed uses, promoting competition, and enabling efficient, innovative, and productive use of one of the nation's most valuable spectrum bands while preserving a healthy broadcast industry. Nobody's ever conducted an incentive auction before, and we're trying to improve our chances of success by reducing risk wherever we can. One risk we see is that although we hope to be able to clear a significant amount of spectrum in the vast majority of geographic markets, we anticipate there may be some geographic markets where we can't clear as much spectrum. But we don't want these markets to become the least common denominator for a nationwide band plan. Instead, in the notice, the Commission identified the ability to accommodate market variation as one of the criteria for evaluating band plans. In May, we held a workshop in which we invited engineers and others representing interested stakeholders to discuss possible band plans. Following the workshop, we recognized the need to develop the record further on an issue that received little attention in the comments to date, and that is the possibility of market variation. The Commission had identified this notice, this issue in the notice, but it's not fully addressed by most of the commenters' band plans, proposed band plans. And at the request of its technical staff, 
the Bureau therefore released a public notice seeking to focus stakeholders on the issue of market variation. We're trying to reduce the risk of not achieving the goals laid out by the Commission, and we believe that this input is critical in our effort to craft a successful incentive auction. Another major spectrum policy innovation we're focused on moving forward is dynamic spectrum sharing, specifically in the context of the 3.5 gigahertz band. The Bureau is committed to helping identify exclusive use spectrum wherever we can, but there are additional opportunities to bring spectrum to market through new approaches. Database-enabled spectrum sharing is one of those cutting-edge techniques, and we're laying the groundwork now for spectrum policy for years to come. The 3.5 gigahertz rulemaking tees up a number of important issues, including how to distribute rights among uh, possible users while protecting incumbents, how to assign those rights, and how to coordinate use among different rights holders. The notice also seeks comment on a framework that enables dynamic sharing. It's complicated. It requires fresh thinking and innovative policy approaches, but it has the potential to open a great deal of spectrum for shared use. Qualcomm has done a great deal of work and put a lot of thought into solving this problem, and I want to commend them for it. They offer an interesting viewpoint more carefully considering their proposal. But as with all stakeholder proposals, we'll keep in mind it's one viewpoint among several competing visions for the band. Staff is working again across multiple di disciplines and in close coordination with our federal counterparts to develop recommendations for the commission. In addition to these spectrum policy initiatives, we continue to remove barriers to wireless infrastructure deployment. The commission's action to create a shot clock was a helpful step but we can do more, working with wireless service and infrastructure providers, state, local, and tribal governments. So at a broader level, continuing to remove barriers to broadband build-out requires a comprehensive approach, and now it's time for our rulemaking, and that's what we are working on uh, to look at a variety of issues affecting wireless infrastructure. And finally, as we continue to promote competition, to drive wireless innovation and investment in consumer choice. We're doing this through our review of transactions as well as rulemakings. The Commission is reviewing its policies on mobile spectrum holdings to ensure that they reflect the evolving marketplace and continue to promote competition. And while the Commission has approved more than 1,000 spectrum license transfers or assignments in the first half of 2013 alone, in the past the Commission has also conditioned deals that would not otherwise be found to serve the public interest. Thanks so much for your attention, and I'd be happy to take questions. Hi, Ruth. Um, first off, I appreciate all your very hard efforts to try to implement a very complex incentive auction. Um, speaking just, obviously you can't comment on the details, but what strikes me about this auction is that, you know, you, the original cosine theory is, all right, you know, we, auctions are, are used as the best way of allocating spectrum. The person who wants to put the highest value use will bid the most. So we started doing that in the 90s. And Congress also woke up and said, this is a great revenue source. This is fantastic. So, from, I think from the congressional point of view, well, oh yeah, great, nice, efficient allocation of spectrum. I've got policy priorities that I now want to fund. And I think in the case of, of the upcoming voluntary incentive auctions, you have this huge laundry list that Congress expects to be paid for out of it. Now, you know, you've got everything from first net, to paying off the broadcasters, to repacking, to, you know, deficit reduction. At the same time, you guys are under a lot of pressure to you implement policies that could hypothetically uh, lower auction revenues. Oh, I take some of the beachfront spectrum and give it for unlicensed use so we get no money for it. Or put in bidder exclusion rules which could lower auction. How are you guys, given the congressional pressure, dealing with these expectations of high auction revenue? Um, well, as I mentioned, I think our uh, policy operating view within the commission is that the auction will be successful if it achieves all of these things. Clearly, the auction can't close unless 
the proceeds from the forward auction are sufficient to compensate the broadcasters that turn in their spectrum lights. There's also the $1.75 billion for relocation of incumbents that you mentioned. There's FirstNet, uh, and then there's deficit reduction. So um, we're definitely focused on all of those. The, some of these problems, when you get right down to solving them, may be less difficult than one might think uh, a priori. For example, uh, what the record reflects is that we're going to need substantial guard bands, uh, and there is a lot of concern by potential bidders for the licensed spectrum that the uses of the guard bands be low power, uh, think unlicensed, but um, uses that will not conflict or impede in any way the high value licensed uses. So I guess I don't see a conflict between, I don't think that um, designating some spectrum for unlicensed is likely to reduce revenue. And then as to the competition issues that you alluded to, we now have folks saying in the record that any restriction on the largest wireless carriers will necessarily lower revenue. In fact, the Phoenix Center filed something. You don't file. <laughs> there was a paper that was filed, perhaps. Or <laughs> I have seen a Phoenix Center <laughs> paper. You it has come to my attention. Uh, and we have um, papers and studies by some of the other wireless carriers saying, no, actually, it's possible to construct uh, a competitive option in a way that does not have a diminishing effect on revenues. And Coleman also has done a paper on this. Just because I mentioned you, Coleman, you had to ask a question. So first, I'll apologize for those uh, high expectations of revenues causing all the trouble now. Um, you mentioned the, the, I guess, asymmetric clearing of spectrum that you might get different amounts in different markets. Could you talk a little bit more about sort of what, how we should think about that, and what might drive the decision? I would assume that in, the easy question is if you can just by relocating existing broadcasters clear spectrum that's a low cost way to make spectrum available, extra spectrum in some markets available. But when you have to think about buying out broadcasters to make extra spectrum available in some markets as opposed to others, can you give us any thoughts about how to think about that question? Um, so first of all, before I answer the question, I want to make one thing clear that I think we haven't always been clear about. And that's that we're not trying to maximize the amount of spectrum everywhere in the country. So if we're in a rural area where there are very few broadcasters and we don't even need any to turn them in to you know, get a ton of wireless spectrum, we're not planning to do that. We're planning to try to have a consistent amount nationwide so that the major urban areas have the same amount of spectrum. Having said that, um, think about Buffalo, close to the Canadian border, uh, having to deal with Canadian television allotments as well as as uh, U.S. ones, or uh, broadcast stations that may feel like they have hold out value. In order to make sure that the auction can close, um, we don't want to have, we, there may be a limit to the amount of money that we can pay those stations. And we might decide that in those markets, we're better off having less wireless spectrum and and then we would have some market variation. We would have one amount across the country and then less in those particular areas. Did that answer your question or not? Sort well, of. If, if the answer, if, if the fill-in is if, if looking at the total constraint on how much money from the Ford auction you have to spend, that you may run out of money. If that's the answer, that answers it very well. <laughs> Well, that's a significant constraint. What we don't want to have is a situation in which, in order to achieve X megahertz of spectrum, we have to pay, you know, a trillion dollars because we're not going to get a trillion dollars in the forward auction, and that would mean that the auction would not close. It would fail.
Ruth, uh, thank you very much for a very clear talk. Um, I am. I heard uh, your discussion of the and understand the focus on the incentive auctions right now. What I'm wondering about is that as you look forward, if you were to allow yourself the luxury, if you will, of looking past the incentive auction, suppose that goes swimmingly well, we still will be in a situation, will we not, uh, where the challenge will, will continue of, of generating additional supply and uses, uh, uh, usability of spectrum. What are you thinking about as those next big steps that, that come down the road? So, in addition to the incentive auction, of course, we have the other 65 megahertz of spectrum below 3 gigahertz identified in the Spectrum Act or partially identified the H block and US3. One of the reasons that we're so interested in exploring new options in the 3.5 gigahertz band is that if we can pioneer new techniques for making spectrum available, if we can uh, think a little outside the box or beyond what the Commission has traditionally done, then it may be that there are other opportunities for additional spectrum. But I think we, we won't probably, we can't count on that until we get a little farther down the road with 3.5. And that, then the presidential memorandum this morning, of course, is encouraging because it uh, looks at different ways of, um, of sharing federal spectrum, federal and commercial spectrum. transmission, don't we? Um, to go back, this is something I've been thinking about a lot, so bear with me. You mentioned Buffalo as an example of a uh, fairly large metropolitan area that might have a spectrum value for the 600 megahertz spectrum, but the cost of releasing it might be too high. Um, so that, that there would not be no 600 megahertz free up in the Buffalo area, is that? Um, I didn't mean that there would be none. Okay. I, what I meant was that uh, you can conceive of an amount of a situation in which you have X megahertz freed up in most of the country and something less than that. But I wouldn't anticipate that it would be zero. It would be zero, but it would be less. Right. So my question then becomes, and this is hypothetical, maybe you don't need to answer, but I do a lot of the first net issues, and it seems to me that a place like Buffalo, the 700 megahertz public safety spectrum might be more valuable if there's less 600 megahertz uh, spectrum. Uh, maybe Cole would answer my question. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you for letting me put that out there because it's something that I'm dealing with. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, then there's a, also the question of how much spectrum you need in Buffalo as opposed to New York City or the Washington metropolitan area in LA or Chicago. Thank you. Um, can you talk, and then just with the carriers, some talk about capping um, the amount of um, under one gig spectrum that the larger carriers, AT&T and Verizon, would own? What are, can you comment on thoughts um, the Commission has in that regard in listening to the, the um, you know, views of AT, or excuse me, Sprint and T-Mobile? So that's an issue that's teed up in the mobile spectrum holdings proceeding that the Commission released last September at the same time that it released the incentive auction proceeding. And I have to say that is a proceeding in which there is virtually no consensus in the record. <laughs> um, so as you, as you noted, we have companies like ATT and Verizon arguing that one should not uh, treat one below one gigahertz spectrum differently. We have other companies arguing with various different proposals that it, um, we should have a cap on below one gigahertz, we should have a different screen for below one gigahertz. We have commenters arguing that we should weight all spectrum, so perhaps it's not just a distinction between below and above one gigahertz, but each band potentially could be given a different weight. So at this point, we are really still thinking about all the options. Other questions for Ruth? Going once? <laughs> Going, uh, well, I thought we'd provoke somebody. Go ahead. Um, so I'm not sure if, uh, 
I'm, I'm not sure. How, I don't know if you can answer this or not. Um, you talked about ways that we might think about whether the auction is a, is a success afterwards, the three, three things. But given all of the constraints that have been imposed on the commission by the, by the law, uh, can you, is there a way to say what it is that the auction wants to maximize? I mean, what is the ultimate objective? Is, do you want to maximize the amount of spectrum put out there? Do you want to sort of maximize post-auction competition in some measure? Um, I mean, all of these things affect the others, and of course, they're all subject to the constraints that Congress imposed. Right. Um, I'd say as a general matter, we want to ma maximize spectrum, but for both licensed and unlicensed use. The, a lot of the commenters, and then the question is, well, what kind of spectrum? So there's a lot in the record about a goal of maximizing paired spectrum. Um, there are other companies arguing for maximizing unlicensed spectrum as well. But I think maximizing spectrum consistent with the other objectives that have been laid out in the statute is the way we're thinking about it at the moment. Other, other questions? <coughs> If not, please help me thank Ruth very much. Okay, uh, I think we will move directly to our next presenter, who is Jennifer Pritchie, uh, who is the uh, Managing Director for uh, Equity Research at Wells Fargo. Uh, Jennifer, welcome. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, sorry. background, I am um, a South Side analyst, and since every time I come to D.C., I, it's like a different world, I'm going to assume Wall Street is kind of a different world to many of you, so I'll just give a quick background of my um, experience, client base, etc. I've followed the wireless industry um, since 1997 in a senior role, which makes me one of the longest tenured analysts in this ever-changing <laughs> world. Um, I've been at the same bank with many different names, came across many of the acquisitions, made it through the meltdown of 2008 with bullets grazing my ears. But um, I followed really the wireless side since that time and picked up the wireline segment um, and the whole convergence of everything that came with it and the tower sector in 2001. Um, I'm based in Chicago, but um, I do, I spent more time in New York. And my client base is um, anyone who might manage your 401k, pension fund if you have one, um, IRA, things like that. I deal with institutional portfolio managers. So my job, I follow, I think it's now 18, 19 stocks. Um, I'm telling them whether they should own AT&T or sell AT&T, Sprint, Verizon. And as I mentioned, I follow the tower sectors and many of the wireline carriers as well, the former CLEX that are still around. Um, Carolyn asked me to, um, you know, talk about uh, the exact title of my presentation is making a business case for continued investment in the mobile wire broadband sector. And frankly, I just put up a few slides that just show many of what you know, and I can talk to them. Um, but as we look at the world, wireless is really evolving from what we used to look at as a subscriber-driven model to more of an ARPA-driven model. Verizon kind of coined that acronym average revenue per account. It used to be our PU average revenue per unit. But with the change in um, the new data plans that at and and Verizon rolled out, we really saw in last summer, we really have seen a change in the industry. You know, with, you, with wireless, as we show here, well over 100% penetrated, including my you know, five-year-old twins in that denominator. Um, you really are not looking for growth in subs anymore, but it's just getting the penetration within that subscriber. 
um, you know, we look at things like how penetrated is a person with an iPad and I, and, you know, a, a iPhone and a BlackBerry. Like I carry, it's, I'm 300 percent penetrated. So as Wall Street looks at the world, that's been kind of a transition we're weaning through. Even though subscribers are still important, what we're trying to show my investors is that you've got to look at it a different way. And I do think the rollout of these data plans last summer really helped that. Certainly the smartphones um, have, you know, as many Ruth and other speakers spoke to before her, um, the data demands on the network are really changing the drivers of the business. And we'll get to investment, but that, this kind of just shows that. Um, I think I've, some of this is repetitive, but these are our estimated um, device usage growth. I mean, what we, when we follow the like, tower sector names like American Tower, Comcast, um, and SBI, what we say to clients is it's, all you have to do is look at the first page of the Cisco um, mobile forecast to really see where this industry is going. And there's something, you know, it was quoted earlier, but less than 20% penetration of LTE devices in the U.S., and yet the average LTE connection uses something like 20 times the average 3G connection. So you know where this is going, especially as more handsets, including the iPhone 5, become L our LTE enabled. enabled. Um, so this is, you know, the chart I really wanted to spend some time most talking about, the one on the lower left-hand side, because that really is the basis of why I was asked to speak. Um, cumulative capital investment. Every time I would, and you can see I don't predict beyond 2012, because every time I did, it was wrong. We'd always have this, this chart going like this, flat, down. Um, and really, as you can see from this chart, in the, almost the entire time I've followed the industry since 97, that has never, never been correct. That every time it has gone up. And even carriers like Verizon, and I know Charlotte's here, but I are so ahead of the curve um, with LTE. They're spending, you know, flat wireless um, CapEx, which is still a, a heavy dollar amount when you consider that they you know, ended last year with well over, I think, 250 million covered tops of LTE, and now certainly most of the nation will soon to be done if not already. Um, so what we are seeing now is this densification of the infill building with many of the other carriers, with um, Verizon, AT&T, and then carriers who weren't spending in the past, like such as T-Mobile, Sprint is obviously involved in their whole soap opera of a story, but beginning to spend, or you know, again reinvigorated re to spend on the network. Um, cell sites, same point here. Um, you know, Peter and I were talking last night. I, I do think this number continues to go up. It's just how how um, how many of uh, how many of those are small sites, macro sites, and whatnot. Um, this is just the revenue. This is kind of, again, going to what my clients look at. We talk about revenue per megabit declining as traffic increases. So it's a big focus on pricing. Um, what I thought was, again, mentioning the AT&T and Verizon move to, data, uh, to share data plans, I think was a really significant move that we have yet to see the full effect of. Because with that, they really moved it away from a pricing model to more of a data-driven one and effectively took, a, took away what we call the over-the-top threat, where voice it was a commodity that was everyone was pricing, texting was a commodity, and now both those companies um, have set a fixed fee for unlimited use of voice and um, data, excuse me, voice and text, and really are now pricing on a metered basis, per se, as to how much data growth, your data you are using. And I think that's very positive for the model because it's going to really drive what we call this ARPA, or average revenue per account up. And again, I think it's, we're only a year into it, so I still think we have much to see with that. Those are my really only prepared slides. Uh, Carolyn also asked me to talk about a little bit of how Wall Street perceives this industry. And if I were to say extremely competitive, I think it's an understatement. You know, we have... Um, and there's so many different sub-segments of this, and certainly a lot of M&A has gone on in the last year, really since October. But um, what we view is probably the most competitive space is the prepaid space. And any sort of walk down a, you know, the mobile section of Walmart would show you that. I mean, you can make a case between all the MVNOs that there's about 10 different plus, I think I'm being low actually, 10 to 15 different competitors in an average market for the wireless prepaid space. 
On the post Bay side, it's a little bit different. Um, you know, you have certainly with the breakup of AT and T and T Mobile that created a lot of um, game changing for our my industry, the Wall Street side of it as well because of the stock. But what you are seeing is um, this view among a lot of the Wall Street people that there is this kind of duopoly with AT and T and Verizon and a distant distant measure between number two and number three and number four. Now that's changing. I would almost say. In some cases, you could argue with Verizon's recent results, it's almost a creeping monopoly because they have really done so well in recent times. Um, whereas AT&T has done well, but I think they're more the vulnerable target for the people, the T-Mobile turnaround, who has been not shy about not highlighting, about very much highlighting them in their ads. Sprint is the wild card in my world. Um, and how Sprint develops is anyone's guess. Right, you know, my personal view is it does end up with SoftBank. We'll see that how that um, materializes in the newest shareholder day. This has been a constant um, game of interest here, but June 25th. And um, I also was asked to talk about Spectrum, and that is also brings in the talk about Sprint and SoftBank and Dish and Clearwire and all that comes with it. Um, but I think Spectrum being the lifeblood of the industry is something we on Wall Street very much appreciate. It's interesting getting today's view and Washington, how, how the steps that are being taken to get more in the hands. Um, but it, in our view, it's an appreciating asset. And what's interesting, at least among the Wall Street segment, is how the conversation has changed among high band spectrum. Um, for a long time, when Clearwire was close to bankruptcy, um, there were changes. Like, no one really felt that spectrum above two gigahertz was really even part of the conversation. I would say, with AT&T's purchase of the remaining part of Nextwave that they didn't own, or the 2.3 that they didn't own by buying Nextwave, it changed all that. Um, and Clearwire becomes an interesting piece here. Um, and with Charlie Ergen and Dish's recent moves, we're not really sure what his intention is. I don't follow Dish, a co coworker of mine does. But I think it's a bet on that this is an appreciating asset. And even if the broadcast spectrum um, auctions do go well, which I believe they will, um, I think that carriers are trying to find a way to get ahead of the curve. Um, you've many of the cases for the capital side, and I think this, this chart on the lower right shows it, as many of the carriers, even those that have been prepared, have really been spending to meet demand, not get ahead of it. And I think, you know, I was quoting um, Randall Stevenson last night at some event I saw him at. He indicated that no one spectrum deal that he has done, where he thought he overpaid for it at the time, in hindsight, he really realized it was very much a bargain. <laughs> so I think that's what we're seeing now is things shift so quickly and carriers not knowing what's ahead and don't want to be in the case maybe AT&T was in 2007 with the rollout of the iPhone and being, you know, my words, not theirs, but maybe somewhat unprepared for the demand on the network. And when you look at what LTE and the figure I gave and how much more usage you see out of the average LTE, that's where um, I think people are concerned. Um, we have heard that carriers like Verizon and AT&T are trying to get ahead of the curve, doing things like rolling out dark fiber to a tower. Um, AT&T, probably Verizon hasn't given this publicly, but AT&T has said 75% of their towers have fiber drawn to them. T-Mobile, 69%. Sprint hasn't given a number publicly. But they are trying to get ahead of that, cur you know, ahead of that curve and then rolling dark or unlit fiber out to the tower is yet another example of that. But spectrum is key here and how this all shakes out. It's, it's been a very fun, not boring industry to follow because the changes in it are really on a daily basis. Um, I just also wanted to talk, Carolyn asked me to talk about how you know carriers differentiate from one of themselves. And as the market matures, that is what we're seeing. I mean, I think Verizon is really known for their map and their coverage and their quality. And that's something that hasn't changed. It's only probably been enhanced with their head start with LTE. I would say T-Mobile has come out very strong with the value message that's been highlighted even more with the uncarrier. 
Sprint has been a little quiet, understandably, as they try to figure out what, you know, their owner, what their strategy is. But I would also expect them to target that value unlimited segment. And AT&T, I think, is rebuilding an image, and I think has effectively done that since the iPhone. I think a, a lot of their network improvements are being seen. But to push on network improvements and network, um, the strength of the network is pretty crowded message right now. So finding a way, now that everyone has the iPhone, everyone has coverage, it's finding different ways to differentiate. And I think from Wall Street's perspective, the concern is if we get to this point where we are mature and um, there is, a, it's a crowded marketplace, how do you differentiate? One of these carriers could pull the pricing lever. And when that happens, it's an industry that's very difficult because you, that ARPA that I hope looks like this begins to turn the other way. And that's where the margins get compromised. But I think what we've seen with, the, I keep mentioning the rollout of these pricing plans, but that was significant because pricing is a, at that time, and I think has continued to be, is in repair. And if the pricing is in repair, margins in repair, and in my world, that's good for my stock. So um, that's kind of how we look at the world. It's very different. Um, but I, we monitor much that comes down um, out of Washington. So it's really helpful to be here today. And with that, I can take any questions. Thank you very much. Okay, questions. Thanks. Uh, I love that you focus on the capital investment as the, as the key thing you follow. Um, would love to under, get your thinking on the trade-off between spectrum and capital. So mm -hmm. in meeting capacity demands, you can add spectrum to network, you can add cell sites or upgrade your technologies. I'd just love your thinking about it. And I think you said you see spectrum as an appreciating asset. That must have implications for your views about capital spending over time. Yes. So, um, you know, I'm not an engineer. I should preface it with that. But from our, our line of thinking has always been that either more spectrum is needed and if not, you can kind of spend through it. And a lot of people, the cynics against it, like an AT&T, would have viewed their announcement last November as just that, saying, we don't have enough spectrum, so we're going to spend $8 billion in incremental dollars over the next three years on our wireless network. Of course, that's not what they were saying. They were saying we are going to invest and bring wireless to rural areas, et cetera. But I don't think it's as simplistic as I just said, either spectrum or capital. I mean, you look, there are people in this room who probably are much more knowledgeable than I am in this respect. But you look at like Verizon's purchase of AWS. They have already spent about 300, you have to spend to deploy that network. I think publicly Verizon has said they've spent 300 million in deployment of that spectrum. Um, so it's certainly, a, I think more spectrum, you know, the analogy that I made, spectrum's like money, you can never have enough. In that, from that carrier perspective, I think they believe that. But there is, I don't think it's just as hand in hand as get more spectrum, therefore my cap action can go down. Because many, the bands are getting complicated and they're not as simplistic, especially as we look at all the solutions that are just presented today. So you do have to spend to deploy that spectrum. But I think in any case, and I'm not sure I'm fully answering your question, but more spectrum coming available will make this chart maybe at least flat now. <laughs> this chart on the bottom left. Fine. So. Oh, I can unfairly and unnecessarily flatten now. <laughs> <laughs> so, can you go back to your slide that had all of the different devices uh, that you uh, listed there? It seems that a lot of your predictions right now are based on what I'll call content consuming uh, systems. Uh, yeah. There's a significant trend in the market that will be emerging over the next five to ten years where a number of devices that will be connected to these wireless networks will be content producing devices, not content consuming. So, how do you see that affecting the revenue per account? Uh, you're going to have all sorts of internet, the, the, the cachet word today is the internet of things, but there's going to be millions upon millions of additional devices being connected over the next 10 years, devices that are not going to have a carbon light form touching a screen or a keyboard. Mm -hmm. So where do you see that fit into the projections that, that, that you have here? And do you, I'm sorry, can you give me, like, do you mean M10 devices? 
Yeah, MDM, okay. you have okay. and trace, you have uh, all sorts of different types of devices, sensors that are going to be using this. I, I personally know of a number of companies that are generating millions of devices that are being planned to be rolled out over the next next three or five years. So from and how do I expect it to affect that? Like ARPA? Absolutely. Yeah. So certainly that would not be additive to an ARPA, but in that case, like my from my carrier side, that would still be margin enhancing because it would have a lower ARPU or average revenue per unit. But because the demands on the network, I'm just thinking of end to end, are not as taxing as let's say a 4G enabled LTE um, iPad. That actually is a higher margin um, product. So if you're Verizon or at and I think that's something you would want. It would not affect these, but it would be in case, you know, revenue enhancing, but more important in my world, margin enhancing. Because even though M to M, you know, so M to M has been something and enhanced devices we've talked about, and I, it just hasn't moved the needle yet. I do believe it will happen, but from a margin standpoint, I actually think it would be positive because they're still touching the revenue, or excuse me, touching the network and touching the spectrum. Because that's the point I'd also make is it's interesting when you, when I'll meet people who don't even look at the wireless industry, and he'll say, I just need to hear about wireless because I have all these companies coming through that aren't even in the telecom arena who are saying, oh, well, my future is mobility. So I need to know what that means. And that's where we go back into the spectrum. That's great, but there's only a finite number of customers. You know, you have to deal with one of my carriers to do that, just given the spectrum. So <clears throat> thank you very much for a, a very interesting talk. Uh, one of the things that you talked about was the movement, I thought you mentioned, to meter pricing, which, which as a longtime student of the industry, I find interesting both in an economic sense and a sociological sense, because telecommunications has traditionally been one that has had flat monthly rates. Uh, we went in the early days of wireless to a per minute rate, and then the industry moved back toward bucket plants that effectively have a per minute rate that is zero until you reach the end of your bucket. And one of the things that I thought I heard you mention is that you were sort of encouraged by the idea of meter pricing and that it would drive additional revenues. If I think about that in, a, in pricing of, let's make it up, gasoline, Mm -hmm. that at the margin, the idea that I have to pay $4 a gallon for gasoline deters me from consuming. So so it might be thought to reduce my demand for that product right. and therefore reduce the, the revenues. So I'm trying to understand both the sociology and the economics of that move. No, absolutely. It's a great question. Um, what I meant by that, John, is the... Um, before last summer, I would often get the question of, well, you're, the carriers are just dumb types. That they're, they, you know, they're, they had no value to the equation, which is painful when you consider the amount of spectrum that they, or the amount of money they paid to get the spectrum. And with these moves, I think they effectively took the end of that. You know, that it's more pay what you use, and um, with, in exchange, we're actually going to encourage your usage because we're going to give you this plan, and instead of thirty dollars for the iPad, we're going to charge you ten dollars. So, and the more you choose the bucket, the higher the bucket, the less the price per megabit. So it actually is, I would argue, the opposite. It's stimulating usage because they're giving you, at a better price point, the device in your hand, in, in this case like a tablet is the example I'm using for $10, and allowing you to choose a family bucket, but not essentially putting the end of um, unlimited usage on the data service because that as we've all heard from the prior speaker, really, I think, is what could tax the network. Their fear is, and I'm speaking for some of the carriers, just that that would be the, the in that case, they would effectively be that price, if that makes sense. So, and a low, it is like, I don't remember the exact price point, but the higher you go, the lower the price per megabit, and it's actually stimulating more usage because they're giving you more devices to tap into that bucket. Fair enough, thank you. Sure. Um, Jennifer, you heard her say they have an open mind over how to structure the auction. From your perspective, 
if they did in fact place some sort of limitation either on the absolute amount that the larger carriers could buy or on the type of spectrum, essentially the below one gigahertz. Mm -hmm. um, what impact would that have, do you think, on the market as well as on, obviously on the individual company? I, um, I think that would be difficult for like an AT&T Verizon, but I just, I have a hard time as a health understanding why you would limit them. Because I, you know, I understand, and this comes from someone who likes Sprint too, but if I look at, um, if I look at what, you know, like a Verizon, I think publicly has said they have, you know, 15, 16 million customers in Manhattan. It's hard for me to, or in New York, it's hard for me to understand how, um, how you could actually limit the amount of spectrum they could have given the amount of customers they have. And I, so for me, and I've heard both at and and Verizon say this, I think you know, they both welcome that conversation to kind of shine a light on it. Um, because I think from a subscriber standpoint, you know, with 195 million or whatever the sub zone, they, they have the ability to engage that conversation in an effective way. I think though, and Maria, it would be negative or certainly if they were, if they were boxed up. So I, I just have a question about the business models. You showed the declining price per megabyte. Mm -hmm. So is Wall Street concerned about how much revenue the operators can keep generating? Do you see the possibility of some you know, real price competition? And then the, the thing that really puzzles me, since I'm an engineer and these are like <laughs> business questions, which is that it seems you could just invest you know, hundreds of billions of dollars in extra network capacity and yet users can just consume that in a microsecond or you know, very easily. I just look at myself, I consume one to four gigabytes a month for my mobile plan, but at home I cut the cord to TV and I'm consuming about 100 gigabytes a month, you know, watching Netflix. Right. 50 to 100, I estimate. And that's not very much TV viewing. And then on the horizon we have 4K TV that runs at twice that. So there's just no question that consumers can consume any amount of data that you give them. But the question is, how much can you charge for it? And you know, can the business model, are, are they threatened by um, kind of future developments? Well, I think to your latter question, it's kind of the point I was trying to make with the limits. Finally, they said, OK, Peter, you can use all that, but you, you've got to pay for what you're going to use. And we'll give you a cheap, the more you use, the cheaper megabit we'll give you. But we're going to, you can't effectively just use it unlimited. Because this, we're gonna charge you to do that. So they were worried about that. I think very much the the business development people probably saw that coming and probably changed things ahead of that, where where we probably are going. Um, but to answer your first question, are people worried about the revenue decline? Absolutely. I mean, I want to emphasize that Wall Street views this business is extremely competitive. Extremely competitive. So. You know, someone like Verizon probably has the highest top line growth and its high single digits. Um, so, you know, they, they have very good margins, like 50% in the last quarter, but the top line growth is a concern, especially as you see, you know, you know, I think the, what, I'm forgetting the numbers, but well over 300, that 300 million wireless subs in the U.S., you know, low population, 310. So, where is that growth coming from? It really has to be you holding a tablet, you doing this, you, you being 400% penetrated versus one. So. Okay, thanks. Sure. So if you combine the, 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 the fact that, that the, the operators are not getting a lot of top line growth, with the projections for the huge economic impact of this, who's getting the benefit of all of this investment? Where where is that coming from? And I think that's a question investors have. Um, 
I mean, like, if I assume your question is on return on capital. Yeah, I mean, it's a high fixed cost business, but I mentioned Verizon. I mean, they're posting some very, very good margin. You know, 50%, AT&T is 42%. I think the big question is, you know, what happens if Sprint and T-Mobile do get their house in order? Are those margins more vulnerable? Um, that's a great question. I think that's when people don't like telecom and can't just even invest in telecom, they say it's uninvestable because of it. <laughs> you know, they just don't see the return on investment there. Um, yeah, I mean, I can see what you're saying. I mean, I don't think that's a terrible analogy. But I think how... Um, but again, I feel like I sound like a broken record, but I think taking the steps they've done and hopefully others will follow, if that pricing, now they're finally kind of getting what they've invested in, that was the first step toward that. And I don't know if we're going to really see the results of that for five years, but I think at least it's a better direction than we were going to Peter's point, because I think that's where the market was headed and we saw that. Could you give your whole talk again for heading you in Brussels instead of DC? <laughs> <laughs> See, and that, I, I'm going to laugh, but I'm not sure I fully appreciate that joke, because I, I, only because I'm coming from a Wall Street world. What, 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 I meant, what, what I meant by it was investing in public companies in Europe. Uh, the wireless industry in Europe is a little different than the yes. US. Could you compare? I'm not sure all these stories would apply there. Yes. No, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't follow European carriers, but I will say that. Um, AT&T has been talking a lot about Europe lately and how that they're, um, they feel that the European experience really lags that of the U.S. in terms of wireless infrastructure and the ga that gap is widening. Um, they've been talking a lot about it. So, you know. Other questions? If not, help me thank Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you.